Hi Rohit, it's really uh, great to be with you here at the South by Southwest. Thank uh, you, yeah, we're having a great time here. It's, uh, it's sunny and not necessarily warm, but it's good. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's great. So uh, listen, um, many of the companies uh, that, we d that we have as customers and ourselves, we realize that we're in a really uncertain world and it's increasingly uncertain, we just look around us. And a lot of challenges in thinking about how to uh, see those risks and opportunities ahead, so that yeah. identifying the trends. Uh, a lot of challenges in actually going about that methodologically. How, how, how do you do that? What's your approach to curating those trends and sort of drawing out implications? So, you know, it's interesting, Graham. A lot of times people call me a futurist. Yeah. And I never liked that term uh, because what I think it means for a lot of people is there's certain types of people who can predict the future. And it's a skill that only those people have. And I don't actually believe that. Like a lot of my work is trying to uh, demonstrate to people that there's certain habits that we can all adopt to be able to see around the corner and to be able to anticipate the future. And so that's what I call non-obvious thinking. Like that's kind of my mission to say, look, how do you think in this way to see what no one else is seeing and then how do you put the pieces together to be able to think about the future? Yeah. 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 No, that's and you have this haystack method of doing that. That's right. That, right. Yeah, yeah. And the haystack method, I mean, we can, you know, sort of look at when you see this time lapse of what the haystack method looks like. Yeah. Uh, it's just me going through all these different stories, uh, curating different information from various places, and then finding themes between all of it, and eventually turning that into, in my case, a chapter in a book. But yeah. anybody can kind of do that. I mean, you could tear articles out of magazines yourself. Yeah. You can put those pieces together. For me, like the biggest thing is a lot of times we react to, okay, what's the news of right now? Right. And we look at everything that's happening right now, but we don't do it on a longer term. Like imagine right. if you ripped an article out of a magazine nine months ago, and then you did more eight months ago. And then eventually you looked at all of this stuff, like it would be different, you yeah. know? You would yeah. see the patterns between yeah. them. Yeah. And one of the things that you've been talking about for a while is this uh, concept of purposeful companies. And what we're seeing right yeah. now and for increasingly is customers consumers really demanding more of companies on the social justice yeah, side, things right. that you know traditionally were the realm of governments, politicians, and nation states. What, what's, what's going on there? What, what sort of led you to come to this purposeful company sort of perspective and, and trend? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we just, we just got off stage here at the Equality Lounge. We're standing outside now, and the topic was social impact. And so you're right, it's totally on everyone's mind because companies are realizing that they need to do more. They're realizing that consumers care. And this is not just a, a consumer, like a B2C type of thing. Like B2B organizations realize that their enterprise customers, their businesses who are customers, care more and more about the practices that they have behind, whether they're doing work in sustainable ways, whether they're actually doing good for the environment, what are they standing for on a social uh, level in terms of the causes that they support. So purposeful profit, like this idea that you can have purpose and you can have profit and they're not two separate things. It's not like, okay, we need to have the purpose over here and then that'll just be our CSR stuff. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the profit's actually separate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's not the mentality anymore. Now the mentality is like, how do we do business in a way that allows us to continue to make a profit, but not destroy the world or make people worse off right. or be evil right. while we do it. Right. But what, what's, what's driven this kind of uh, consumer enlightenment, if you will? What's kind of brought yeah. that about? Because, you know, these things are good and wholesome things that kind of aren't new. But why, why now? Why is, that, uh, why is that enlightenment coming? What's, what's, what's changed? It's a great question. I think there's a couple things that have changed. One is uh, the consumers that are growing up now. So the millennials yeah. who, you, know, you and I are probably like, oh, those millennials, those kids. Yeah. But like the oldest millennials are in their late 30s now. Yeah. I mean, that's not a kid, yeah. right? Uh, they're actually in control of things now. Um, and so the younger generation is one reason. Uh, increased transparency is another reason. Yeah. Uh, we now have the ability to track an entire supply chain in a way that we never did. Yeah. And those doors are being opened for us and our eyes are being opened now into like what is happening along those paths of those supply chains. Yeah. And, and so we're questioning those. We're saying, well, what's happening over here that maybe was invisible before, but is no longer invisible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is quite challenging for companies to navigate because on some issues, there's not a right or a wrong or there's divisions and people have different views. How are you seeing companies kind of navigate that? And is there any kind of good advice you can sort of give for, you know, how do you position yourself yeah. in, that, in that environment? Yeah, I mean, companies are struggling. Uh, I think my biggest advice is uh, that the natural inclination for a lot of companies, especially large companies, is to go towards the, uh, the most showy thing they can do yeah. uh, that doesn't actually create impact, but seems like it would create impact. 
And the problem is that when you go towards the, the thing that seems like it would be most impactful, you end up doing things that actually don't make a difference and then you get called out for it. So the visibility of what you do or what you don't do becomes apparent because you, you post the rainbow square when it's you know, gay, uh, uh, gay pride month, but then your policies from a hiring perspective haven't actually changed at all and you're working in an unwelcoming place for people who are LGBTQ, right? So you have to actually be able to do something in addition to saying you're doing something. And that's a challenge, but not because companies are, are bad, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, bad entities, but because the group that's responsible for talking about it is rarely the group that it's responsible for doing it. Yeah. And when those two groups don't talk, you know what's going to happen, yeah. right? There's a disconnect. And yeah. so fixing that disconnect is a leadership priority. Yeah. Now, that's one of the things I've been struck by just coming out of some of the sessions here is this careful choice of words. So, you know, there's often a, there's a diversity word, but it was pointed out today that actually, why do we use a diversity word? It's representation because we're talking about a full representation of people on the board and, yeah. uh, and other decision-making uh, places. It's not about diversity, this is about just representing society. And that seems to be a very uh, powerful sort of common theme. Coming yeah, you know, the, look, uh, you're, you're, you're talking to somebody who wrote a book called Beyond Diversity. Yeah. So obviously I think there's something bigger that we need to talk about, right? Uh, so yeah, you hear a lot of words. You hear diversity, you hear inclusion, you hear equity, you hear belonging. Uh, and at the end of, of all of these, what I think really we need to get to is more than just the uh, surface level of yeah. what we could do, yeah. right? And the surface level, the definition of surface level is someone saying, well, you must have at least one woman on your board. You don't have to listen to her. Yeah. You don't have to do anything she yeah. says. And you don't have to give her any support, but you have to have her on the board. Yeah. I mean, that's not enough, right? That's never going to be enough. Yeah. And so the real challenge is like, how do we create inclusion for these voices? And how do we actually create a place where they're listened to. Yeah. Because a lot of the innovation that could come, comes from those voices, comes from people who see the industry in totally different ways. Yeah. And also that your customer base is that representation of all those people. So if you're only listening right. to a small, or a, at the, even the majority, you're missing out on products that yeah. are fit for everybody. So I think even, for, you know, even from that sort of business perspective, there's, uh, there's, there's great motivation in doing this. One of the um, other trends that we see, of course, is, um, is, is the change in the retail space and what consumers are expecting on yeah. the experience side. Um, E-commerce has been key sort of driver in that space and particularly yeah. during the pandemic, massive increase. What's next? I mean, we hear the meta universe, but at the same time we hear about experiences in, in, in the real verse, if you will, in yeah. physical space. Yeah. What's happening? What should we expect going forward over the next uh, five, 10 years? How do you see that? Well, I, I do think that digital goods uh, are going to become more popular. People are going to start seeing the value of that. Um, you know, people say, oh, that's such a new idea. Like, will people ever buy their avatar, right? Or will they ever like actually spend money on that? But like, if you think about it, we're used to buying a lot of digital things, right? We buy a digital upgrade on our plane ticket. Now, eventually there's an experience related to that, but the consumer experience is mostly digital, right? And so I think that more and more what you're gonna find is there's retail that's transactional. It's, oh, I need to get the eggs, I need to get the apples. And so either someone delivers it for me or I order it ahead of time and then I just go pick it up and it's more convenient for me that way. And then there's retail experiences that are just that, they're experiences. And so the experiences, I wanna spend time there. I wanna take photos. I wanna have a good um, moment with my family, with my friends, with my kids. And those are different. And so what you'll start to see, I think, is the retail experiences that really succeed are the ones where people are spending that time uh, actually doing something that's fun as opposed to something that's transactional. I mean, right. it's not that much fun to go and pick up your eggs yeah. every week or yeah. however long you, yeah. eat, you need yeah. the, the eggs for. So yeah. like those are experiences are going to be more transactional, more e-commerce driven, more convenience driven. And the experiences, the retail experiences will become more experiential. Can you just speak to some experiences and some examples of what customers and retailers have been doing to um, enliven that physical experience and bring customers back into the store. Are there any examples we have today of uh, how that's playing out? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of crossover examples. There's like uh, retail department stores that have a barber shop inside and a bar inside. There's like crossovers between like, I just, I was actually, yeah, I know, right? Although like we probably don't need the barber part of it so much, but uh, you know, <laughs> but like it's fun because they're putting these different things together and it's like, you know, why not have a good time at the same time? 
time while you're like being able to do these multi yeah, experiences, yeah, yeah. right? Sure. So I think you're seeing more and more of those types of retail experiences standing out for people. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I think one of the things that's quite popular right now, which will definitely die out, is the whole kind of uh, Instagram worthy experience where you literally are paying for creating a great Instagram photo. Like that's the whole experience, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Now that's gonna wane in popularity, but it speaks to something that's like a more of a human condition and a human desire, which is I wanna be able to share with my friends and my family something that was a really cool moment for me. Right. Right. And uh, that's worth paying for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it makes sense, it makes sense. Um, when we think about kind of the supply chains behind that, I mean, now it, it's already complicated, right? You have omni-channel, yeah. B2C, B2B, to b to c you know. Yeah. You, you arrange the letters how you will. Right. There's a lot of complexity. And this sounds like it's gonna get even more complex. I mean, if you're having to navigate sort of even uh, a, a new set of channels and a new sort of dimension here, how, how should companies think about that? Uh, sort of, do you have any insights around how they should navigate to make sure that in delivering these experiences you do it in a way that um, you, know, you can have the supply chain's logistical support to deliver on the customer promise? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's so much opportunity in the world of supply chain transformation. Mm. So one huge opportunity is where do you integrate transparency, right. right? Like how deeply do you let them see the process of right. what you're selling from start to finish? Yeah. And does that become a selling point for you, right? Yeah. Do you become more authentic and more trustworthy because of how deeply you were able to share what right. that whole experience yeah. is? The other thing is like being able to anticipate where the disruption is going to happen, yeah. right? Because supply chain is all about managing the disruption, right? Because if you have one piece that gets messed up, I don't have to tell you, right? Or anybody who's watching this, like you know, if there's one little uh, link in that chain that gets messed up, yeah. all of a sudden you don't have the component you need and then everything uh, gets screwed up. And yeah. so being able to, I mean, this speaks more to this idea of anticipating what's going to happen, yeah. right? Yeah. Nobody can anticipate a war necessarily, maybe some people can, but like there's some things that just, they just happen, right? Yeah. You can't necessarily anticipate a huge tornado. Yeah. But there's other things in business that are totally predictable. Like I, I often, I mean, I grew up in the world of marketing and advertising. And there are marketing campaigns that I see launched and I know they're gonna fail. Right. I don't always know what's gonna succeed, but I pretty much can tell you with 100% certainty which marketing campaigns will fail. Yeah. And the reason why they still launch them is because of ego, it's because of bad advice, it's because of bad strategy, it's because of bad partners, or it's because of stupidity. And they don't have a diverse board. Yeah, maybe that <laughs> one might be part of it, right? That might be part of the issue. But like, we have to start avoiding the predictable stupidity. Right. And I think that that can be done if you just bring the right people in, if you just think about it in the right way. Right. I like that phrase, predictable <laughs> stupidity. I, I like that. Maybe that should be my next book. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's a good one. Hey, you know, we have we have joint uh, copyright. All right, OK, all right, yeah. We got to, I'll, I'll give you like proceeds. I'll give you royalties on it. Um, just some, continuing that theme, so there's, there's a lot of change and disruption coming on the consumer side. But for companies themselves, there's a lot of change coming as well. And you talk about this uh, flex commerce or flux commerce yes. uh, of, of technology really changing companies' operations and, and, and what they need to do to stay relevant. How, yeah. Can you walk us through that and sort of what trends you see there? Yeah, I mean, flux commerce was all around this idea that uh, I mean, automotive companies are becoming software companies, right? A Capital One has a coffee shop. <laughs> like, the idea of flux commerce is that the business that you were in is no longer the only business that you're in. Bike shops are becoming coffee shops. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, there's all this crossover happening. Yeah. And, and what that tells us is that the way we used to think about it, like, if you think about management consulting, right? Yeah. How is it divided up? Okay, here's our manufacturing team, here's our financial services team, here's our retail team, like, here's our pharma team. That was it. They were broken up into, and that's literally what the drop downs were in the menu. Yeah. And now it's like, wait, we have companies that have some pharma, have some uh, retail, and have some financial services. I mean, Apple has a credit card, yeah. right? Yeah. Or at least they used to. Yeah. Like, so there's yeah. crossover with all of these things where pe companies are no longer in that one vertical. And it's, like, and, and it's not that every company is becoming a mega you know, GE that makes like microwaves and then turbines, uh, but companies are blurring those lines more right. and more. And so that's what that trend of flux commerce was about. And so, so if you're gonna be a B2B organization or if you're gonna be a leader that's ready for that, you have to be able to go outside of that one vertical, that one industry vertical. It's no longer enough to say, well, I spent the last 30 years of my career working in manufacturing and that's all I'll ever need. Yeah. That's not the world we're moving into. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you look at companies that are sort of embracing that, 
and sort of benefiting from that. What other attributes? Are there any sort of red threads you can see uh, that sort of make them successful at being yeah. able to flex and be ambidextrous across those, uh, across those, across that flux? In, 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 in yeah, I mean, I, I think that it is leaders who are willing to question their deeply held beliefs. That's a huge aspect right. of it, right? right? Because we all have these things where we, I mean, with experience comes the knowledge that business works a certain way or an industry works a certain way. Right. And it's very difficult to question those truths, right? It's right. very difficult to say, okay, this is how it's always been. This is what happens. Uh, but could it happen differently, right? Um, and so what ends up happening is the entrepreneurial voices, the ones who come along and say, look, we could do things differently. Um, those are the ones that stand out. I mean, there's two entrepreneurs that I talk about uh, in my presentations uh, several times, uh, Akim Naguenya mm -hmm. and uh, Sharif Vregud. And these are two guys who founded a glasses company, eyeglasses company mm -hmm. called Reframed. And the simple thing that they rediscovered is that a lot of glasses, like your glasses, for example, like they don't fit somebody who has a wider nose profile, right. which is many African-American people and many people of other ethnicities as well. So they recreated the glasses frames to actually fit people's faces that weren't catered to by the normal glasses frames. Yeah. Now, other people maybe didn't see that because they didn't have the right diverse teams working on it, right? But there are truths like that. Glasses look this way. This right. product is done this way. The supply chain works in this way. Like we have those things yeah. that we know for a yeah. long, long period of time. And the non-obvious thinkers, right? Yeah. The ones who are able to question that, they're the ones who are ready for that disruption. And they don't get, uh, you know, uh, slammed when that change does happen. They're ahead of the curve. Yeah. And like, that's what I think we should all want. Yeah. Like that's what all of our leaders should want, yeah. to be thinkers like that and to have thinkers like that on their team. Yeah. So, so Ro, this has been uh, fascinating and I wish we had more time, but uh, this has been great. You've been very generous here with your time. Um, you've published widely on these trends, um, yes. but uh, you told me this is kind of coming to an end. This is your last Yeah, one. it's, the, uh, the, it's the, I know, it's the, well, uh, <laughs> so it's the 10 year anniversary of this project that I've been working yeah. on for, for uh, a long time called Non-Obvious Trends and now the Non-Obvious Megatrends. Yeah. So the book is Non-Obvious Megatrends and that really describes a lot of the trends that I'll be speaking about uh, on the big stage tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, uh, but my next book is actually called The Future Normal. And it's all about the 50 ideas and instigators that are changing the world of tomorrow. And it's written, co-authored by uh, another uh, fellow futurist who's based in the UK. Um, his name is Henry Coutinho Mason. And so we're bringing both of our perspectives. He's got sort of the European perspective and he's been working in this space for a long time. I'm based in the US and, uh, and so I travel all the time as well. And when we put those two together, that book's gonna be really exciting because we're gonna talk about uh, just feature stories of people who are shifting the world, changing the world, doing really interesting, fascinating things. And so that'll be out late this year. Fantastic. I look forward to reading it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks for your time. All right. Nice speaking with you, Roy. Bye.